Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by my friend Fred Kagan, the distinguished uh, military historian and uh, military analyst and strategist, uh, director of the Critical Threats Project at the American Enterprise Institute, supervises the Russia team or the team that's uh, covering the Russia, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the war at uh, the Institute for the Study of War, the excellent daily updates that everyone should subscribe to at the Institute for the Study of War if they, uh, if they want to, or if they, not if they want to, even if they don't want to, they should, because they'll learn day to day what's happening in, in the war. So uh, this is a fourth conversation overall with Fred and our third uh, since the war began. Uh, and I think the ones I just looked at them in April and October, about every six months, we're, we're making this a regular thing, um, they stand up very well. And, uh, and but it's time for an update. So Fred, thanks for joining me. Great to be back with you, Bill. Thank you for having me. So, uh, you know, where are we? What's what's the current situation? Uh, what's has surprised you the most, I guess, since the earlier surprises? And uh, and uh, what's the kind of, how, how do we think about this uh, war, which has been going for what, a uh, year and a quarter now? So the world is is holding its breath, waiting for the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Um, and that's the that's the dominant phenomenon uh, on the battlefield. The Russians are continuing to. Uh, to grind their way through the city of Bakhmut um, and have been continuing also to try to take the city of Avdivka, which is near Donetsk city and which they've been trying to take since 2014. Um, and otherwise the Russians have largely finally stopped most of their offensive operations elsewhere and seem to be actually focusing on preparing for Ukrainian counter counteroffensive. Uh, so basically, uh, just I mean, to step back, so we had yeah. the original assault, obviously, repulsed uh, kind of amazingly by the Ukrainians. Then we had the uh, war for a while, and, and it became clear the Russians weren't going to rout the Ukrainians. And that pretty amazing Ukrainian counteroffensive in September, October. But say a word about that, and say a word about just the different fronts. You hear about the South and the East, but uh, some of us don't, don't have this sure. entirely in our heads. So yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's good. Yeah. So, so right. So the Russians started with a with an invasion along uh, multiple axes. Um, in the from they attacked from Belarus and and uh, Western Russia, trying to get to Kiev. That obviously uh, failed completely, and then they withdrew. Uh, at the same time as they were doing that, they were also attacking in the east. Uh, and driving through Luhansk province in the northeast um, and then driving south along the coast uh, of the Sea of Azov um, toward uh, the top of the Crimean Peninsula. And then they drove from the Crimean Peninsula north and then fanned out in, in three different directions. That was the initial Russian invasion. Uh, it was a bad plan um, and it gave the Ukrainians a lot of opportunities to push back, which they did uh, remarkably well. And of course, uh, defeated the attack on Kiev. After that, uh, the Russians focused their efforts on the east and south, uh, primarily, um, which turned rapidly into a focus on the east. And then they ground through uh, most of Luhansk uh, the province while hanging on to gains that they had made in uh, in Kharkiv, which is the province just to the west of uh, Luhansk. Um, and that had, that had been uh, their focus for most of mid- 22. Um, then in late summer, going into fall, the Ukrainians started counteroffensive operations. They telegraphed them in Kherson, uh, in the south, um, at the mouth of the Dnipro River, um, and got the Russians concentrated on defending there. And as the Ukrainians were working on that, they launched a lightning strike in Kharkiv uh, with we now we now we know there were four Ukrainian brigades, uh, which will matter for the later part of the story. Um, routed the Russian forces in Kharkiv in a matter of days, um, really quite embarrassingly. In fact, um, Russians were completely surprised and unprepared, and elements of some of the best, uh, most elite Russian tank units uh, were there in Kharkiv. Uh, they donated something like a hundred tanks uh, to the Ukrainians in their flight, um, which the Ukrainians have put to good use. Uh, and the Ukrainians actually chased the Russians almost entirely out of out of Kharkiv uh, at that time. And then they turned back to Kherson and were able to push the Russians off of the west bank of the Dnipro River. 
Um, and those counteroffensives were very remarkable. They were very significant. They were enabled by um, Ukrainian preparations, but also by the provision of U.S. HIMARS um, long-range precision uh, rockets, which the Ukrainians used to extraordinarily good and innovative effect, especially in the South. Um, and uh, that changed the complexion of the war. Russians made a variety of changes, which we can go into if you're interested. Um, but the Ukrainian attacks culminated, um, and they they culminated in part because the U.S. and the West had been slow, way too slow, to provide the Ukrainians with the resources that they needed to keep those uh, counteroffensives going. Uh, that was unfortunate because it allowed the Russians to regain the initiative. Russians did a big mobilization uh, in the late fall, and uh, starting shortly after the new year, they leaned into the Russians did uh, what was supposed to be their major offensive operation of the winter, which was in Luhansk. And they were trying to push back to the Luhansk boundary and, and into uh, Kharkiv. That's the counteroffensive, or that's the offensive operation that very few people heard about because the Ukrainians stopped it cold. Uh, that's where most of the Russian reserves went. That was the main focus of Russian efforts in January and February, and it, it just went nowhere. The Ukrainians just stuffed it. I'm I'm trying to rack my brains, honestly, Bill, because I'm I've spent many years teaching uh, that there has never been a me major prepared mechanized offensive operation that didn't penetrate the initial defenses of the enemy positions, which has historically, I believe, been true. The Russians may just have made a bad record in that regard. This may have <laughs> been the first major mechanized offensive that actually was stopped cold and made virtually no gains. Um, it was really quite stunning. Um, while the Russians were doing that, we, they were also pushing in Bakhmut, uh, obviously with different forces and the Ukrainians were defending there. We had the whole um, kerfuffle with the Americans and others having a lot of opinions about what the Ukrainians should and should not do. But in the meantime, the Ukrainians have been preparing uh, with our assistance um, the counteroffensive operation that we're all eagerly awaiting. And we are told repeatedly by Russians and Ukra by Americans and Ukrainians that the Ukrainians have nine brigades prepared for this uh, counteroffensive, which again is significant because they, they routed the Russians in Kharkiv with four. So this is, uh, we're already talking about a counteroffensive operation on a significantly larger scale on the Ukrainian side. And it's also one that they have been preparing more deliberately uh, for a longer period of time. So I think it's important to keep that in mind as we talk about, you know, people are very fixated on the Russian defenses and the Russian preparations for this. Uh, the Ukrainians have also been really getting ready for this. So, well, so let's just talk about that. I mean, what, what without giving away anything that you don't want to say, obviously, but what, uh, what's your sense from publicly available data of this, the Russian situation, the Ukrainian situation? I mean, the the... What should we be looking for over the next three, six months to see whether this is how successful could one expect it to be or reasonably expect it to be? Or what would be the markers of success or failure? Um, I, I'm not going to talk about the Ukrainian situation more than I already have. Um, the Russian situation is not good. Um, I, there's been a lot of focus on the on the trench lines and dragon's teeth and obstacles the Russians have, have been laying all throughout the south. Um, it's important not to overstate the significance of those things. Um, it's, there've been some particularly inappropriate analogies drawn to Verdun and other World War I examples. And that's nonsense. Um, it's, it's nonsense for several reasons. First of all, there were no tanks at Verdun <laughs> and that matters. But second of all, these are not anything like the kinds of fortifications or trench systems that uh, both sides had developed uh, by 1915, honestly, in the First World War. They're not as evolved, they're not as deep, they're not as extensive, but most importantly, they're not um, filled with anything approaching the force densities that we had seen on the Western Front in 1914, and this is, this, or in, in the First World War. This, this is an important point because trenches that don't have people in them are just trenches. Hmm. And a lot of these Russian positions, I think, don't have a lot of people in them. 
because as we've as we've looked around and we ISW has published some uh, some great maps showing our and and order of battle showing you know our assessments of where the Russian forces actually are. Um, they match what the Russians themselves say, uh, which is that they they do not have adequate force densities in various parts of the front to hold off a serious uh, mechan- Ukrainian mechanized counteroffensive. So, um, I. I, I think it's easy to be too impressed by uh, field fortifications, uh, and I think we need to we need to avoid that. The Russian forces are in terrible shape. They have been fighting continuously. They are um, the their initial units, the initial professional soldiers, initial elite troops have been ground to pieces. Uh, I still also done some great work pointing out that the Russian so-called elite forces are no longer elite. Their, their airborne forces are, are largely full of mobilized reservists. Uh, even their Spetsnaz uh, units, which are their special forces guys, m- more they do more conventional warfare kind of stuff than our soft guys do, but it's their equivalent. Those guys, there are reports that some of those uh, Spetsnaz units have taken 90% casualties over the course of this war. So effectively destroyed. Um, presumably reconstituted, but they're reconstituted with Mobix, with uh, mobilized reservists. Um, so they're not elite anymore. So that's one problem the Russians have. The other problem the Russians have is they've lost so many tanks and they've lost so many more tanks than they've been able to produce that they're very thin on tanks on the mm-hmm. ground. And this is why they've been bringing T-55s and other, you know, ancient, um, God, it, it really, it really brought me back. I saw the, saw a video of the Russians moving and, and IS-2, which was a, a World War II, like 1945 era tank uh, on a train, like they were going to move, move it somewhere and do something with it. Um that's what they're reduced to. That's important for a bunch of other reasons, but they're thin on tanks. So what you have on the Russian side is a lot of lightly mechanized, um, badly trained, badly supplied, badly demoralized uh, personnel who have not on the whole been being allowed actually to prepare to receive a major Ukrainian counteroffensive. Because the Russians have been concentrating on offensive operations along most of the line with most of their forces uh, right up until very recently. So the, f- the real question here is what are the Ukrainians capable of doing? And we're not going to know until they do it. Um, but they have a real opportunity uh, based on the, the weaknesses of the Russians in, in just about every way. Now, that having been said, um, I think it's important to realize that this is this the Ukrainian counteroffensive is probably not going to take the form of a single widespread, large scale, decisive blow that runs all all the way to the sea and the borders and the war is over. That's that's extraordinarily unlikely to happen. It will probably evolve in a series of operations over time. And each individual operation will probably culminate at various points. You can only drive so far and then you have to stop. Um, either because there's the enemy puts up resistance finally or because you get tired and you outrun your uh, logistics and you have to resupply and stuff. So we should expect to see Ukrainian advances punctuated by pauses. And it's really important that we not overread the pauses because it reminds me back, I'm sure Bill, you remember 2003 as US forces were driving up from Kuwait on Baghdad, there was a, there was a moment where there seemed, there was a pause in the US advance. There seemed to be a pause. I think it was about three or four days in. And immediately we had headlines saying, it's a quagmire. Hmm. You remember? remember? It's because everything is a quagmire. As soon as everything is not happening instantly, it's a quagmire. Right. Um, 
And I think that there's going to be a certain tendency here to look at any pause in the Ukrainian counteroffensive and see, oh, okay, that's it. See, the Ukrainians can't do this anymore. That's probably not going to be true. So we'll need to wait, expect this to last some time, expect it to have some pauses, expect the Ukrainians to suffer some setbacks. Um, but I think that there's a, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic that the Ukrainians can retake a lot of territory that matters. And this fa- next phase of the war, uh, I guess maybe the third phase, if the first phase was the Ukrainians re- re- you know, repulsing the Russians, and then the second phase, the kind of Russian, and then their offensives in September, October, I guess it was, and then the Russian uh, offensive. Uh, so maybe it's four phases. Anyway, um, this is months, I mean, three months, six months, we don't know, obviously, but ballpark, that kind of thing. I mean, when would we have a sense? When would you have a sense if we have a next conversation that things are, we're in a new moment or or we've sort of, uh, we, sh- we should be pleased by where we are, worried about where we are. What, is that a conversation for October? For Well, I, look, I mean, I think if we don't know where we are by October, then something something very bad is going to have happened. Um, if the Ukrainians are going to get the counteroffensive off in the coming weeks, which everybody seems to think that they will, um, you know, I think we will have a sense you know, within a month of when, whenever they actually start the major phase of the hmm. counteroffensive, so that for quickly how this you is can get us that. Yeah, it's not. I think out. I think so because interesting. You know, f- look, fundamentally, either the Ukrainians are going to be able to penetrate the initial uh, Russian defensive positions and drive into the rear, or the Russians are going to be able to force them to grind slowly forward. Uh, that's going to be basically what what we're looking for. Keeping in mind that the Ukrainians might choose to grind slowly forward in certain areas in order to keep Russian forces fixed there or whatever. But at a certain point, if the Ukrainians don't break through the Russian front lines and start uh, driving rapidly, I think that's going to be an indication this is not going to go as well as we would like it to. And in terms of materiel, um, the US and the Allies have, uh, do you feel that we've done a very good job, pretty good job, insufficient job of providing what the Ukrainians need and deserve? You said earlier that in the earlier moment, you think they could have done more if they had had more uh, material from us. It's insufficient. Um, the, the public reporting I've seen is that the allies have provided the Ukrainians something like 230 tanks. Um, you know, let me contextualize that for you. The nine brigades that the Ukrainians reportedly have is the equivalent of three divisions. Uh, the tank division should have about 330 tanks in it. Hmm. Um, you know, so we should be, if you want to scale that down and say these are mechanized divisions, okay, it should have 150 tanks in it. Um, that should be something more like 450, 500 tanks. Um, we're talking about half that. Um, that's unfortunate. That's, um, we should have done better than that. We've known for more than a year that there was going to be a requirement to do something like this. We were very slow to accept that we were going to have to provide Ukrainian uh, Ukraine with Western tanks. Uh, then we had a lot of alliance kerfuffle about who was going to provide what tanks uh, and when. And the net result is that the Ukrainians are going to go into this offensive counteroffensive with uh, a lot fewer tanks than they should have. Um, they're designing a counteroffensive knowing that. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily fatal, but it's unfortunate. And it's the continuation of a, a an unwise policy, I think, within the, the framework of a generally sound policy of supporting Ukraine. I think there's been an unwise sub-policy of metering uh, support to Ukraine in ways that have protracted the war. And and risk protracting it further. And I really do think that the whole notion of escalation calculus is backward in the minds of some of the people who are pushing for delays in this kind of metering, because the argument has been, you know, if we, if we give the Ukrainians too much Western kit too fast, then that's escalatory and the Russians might do something. Um, the problem is that Giving the Ukrainians the this sort of this sort of titrated uh, kind of supply protracts the war, and the greater escalation risk is in the protraction of the war, hmm. because 
Putin's escalation options at this point are extremely limited and bad. Um, the longer this goes on and the more that we give Putin actually time a, to realize that he has to mobilize Russia fully and B, actually to do it, the more that he can start regenerating escalation options for himself. So I think the you know things that we're hearing out of the administration publicly suggest that they've sort of realized that, that they need to focus on getting this over quickly, but they made that a lot harder for themselves by a lot of decisions that they made over the summer and fall and winter of 22. And how much of this was were decisions made for whatever reasons that presumably the reasons you basically sketch out of uh, and how much of it was constraints i mean that they just we don't have a defense industrial com defense industrial complex we once have we have allies who did need to be brought along more slowly and, and so forth um we have m1 tanks that we could give the ukrainians we have lots of tanks and, and a lot of them aren't we don't anticipate using them in the next <laughs> year or two right this is the scenario that we're holding them for primarily. Yeah, right. We, we built up a huge military for the sake of fighting a war in Europe. We didn't have to fight a war in Europe in the Cold War or, or since then, really. Yeah. And so now we have a war. Right. Now we have a war in Europe, but we're waiting. What are we waiting for? The war, the, the ground, the land war in Asia? I don't know. You know. Well, right. Exactly. I mean, the one thing that I'm confident the Taiwan scenario is not going to need is a lot of M1 tanks. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, the Biden administration has made it clear what how enthusiastic it isn't for fighting a war in the Middle East. So, you know, what, what are we holding them back for? Um, no, the issue is we had a whole bunch of we didn't I, we, I, I don't even want to speculate about all the theories, but we have M1 tanks. We, we could have provided a lot of, and we are providing them now. But and this has been this has been, the of course, the thing that makes it a little bit hard to take a lot of the administration excuses about delays seriously, because. We have a whole bunch of excuses about how we can't do this, that, and the other thing. And then some months later, it turns out that we can. And so, you know, the truth is, and we published this at ISW months ago, it was visible in May, in last May, that we were going to have to give the Ukrainians tanks. And if we had started actively getting ourselves ready to do that, we would have been able to do it in a timely fashion. But we were, on the contrary, deciding that we weren't going to do it. And... We keep making, we keep having these discussions. We keep saying, well, okay, F-16s, there's, it, it's too hard. There's a lot of, it'll take a long time to do, to, you know, to get the Ukrainians able to use them for various reasons. Some of them technical, actually real technical and stuff. Okay, fine. Get ready. Right. So get, get after it because we're, we're ultimately going to have to re-equip. This is the thing we need to work all the way through our minds. And we're, this is, for some reason, we're having a really hard time with this. We are going to have to fully re-equip Ukraine with Western systems. That is a fact. If Ukraine is going to have a military over the long term, it is going to be a military equipped with Western systems for the excellent reason that the Russians are not going to sell Ukraine Soviet systems. Right? right? I mean, pretty clear. So we need to recognize that, the work, yes, Ukraine is going to have to have F-16s at some point. Because those are the only fighters we're going to be able to give them, or you know, Euro fighters of, of some other variety. Yes, they're going to have to be equipped with with um, Leopard twos or with M ones or something or Challengers, because those are the only tanks that they're going to be able to get. So we need to recognize that, and we need to be preparing now. We should have been preparing months ago, fully to re-equip the Ukrainian military along these lines as rapidly as possible. Um. Which brings to the next point, though, which is the defense industrial base. Do we have a problem with our defense industrial? Yes, we do. We have serious constraints. Okay. Constraints in defense industrial capacity are partially amenable to solutions if you spend money to solve those problems. They're not entirely amenable to immediate solutions. There, there are actual limitations uh, that come from various things related to the complexity of our weapon systems and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, this should have, you know, clanging alarm bells going off that our defense industrial base is inadequate for any major conflict that we would need to be looking at, including Taiwan. And the solution to that is significant expansion of defense budget to address uh, the need to strengthen the defense industrial base. Has the administration undertaken to do that? No, it hasn't fundamentally. And this is this is uh, a, this is a big problem. Yeah, that's what strikes me. We discussed this, I think, in the last conversation. The administration has done, a, if I can oversimplify, a pretty good job in dealing with the immediate 
situation, though, as you say, they were slow on and remain, and that was, we paid a price for that in terms of the actual arms they sent. But it doesn't feel to me like they've thought to themselves, this is the beginning of a new world where maybe it's not really a new world, maybe we should have seen it coming before in 2014 and so forth, but whatever, this is the alarm bell, let's just put it that way. And we need to do all kinds of things. Uh, before I was critical of, I've got, I want to ask you about this, uh, of them on energy for not also being mm -hmm. so serious enough about that. I think I might've been a little wrong about that, that they did more behind the scenes or maybe we got lucky over the winter or the Europeans did more. But I'm, I'm curious in general on the kind of, let's just take a minute on the, yeah, thinking about the new world challenge we face. Uh, I want to ask you, say a word about energy if you want, say a word about Europe. And just on the other, on this last point you made, I, if I can uh, go on for one more minute, what's of course, I'm going to say funny isn't the right word. What's ironic is if you don't want to give the Ukrainians a ton of weaponry, then we can fight. I mean, we in the Europe, you know, then let them into NATO. I mean, seriously, <laughs> the alternative to giving them F-16s yeah. is for us to fly F-16s, which, right. I mean, maybe that's fine. I mean, you know, we're good at flying F-16s and, you know, I'm <laughs> sure our pilots would be happy to destroy Russian forces because they're horrible, you know, they're committing horrible war crimes and so forth. It's a just cause. But it's a little crazy to say we're never going to use your American troops or it's not, a, we're not going to let Ukraine into NATO, but we're a little hesitant about sending them, selling them stuff. Unless you think, Russia's going to change or Putin's going to be thrown uh, out, out of power next week, which would be nice. But, you know, unless you think the security threat goes away or we don't have to deal with it, it is kind of weird to sort of be so hesitant to supply the front line that's facing the actual real existing security threat, more than threat, you know. No, the, the, you look, you're, you're exactly right. We are speaking very cynically, and I think we've talked about this before. I'm not, you know, I'm not super happy about the this as a moral ethical position, but as a geostrategic position, the, the United States and the Western Alliance is in principle in a very happy place right now because we have been concerned about a Russian military buildup. Uh, we have been concerned about the ability to defend NATO member states, um, particularly the Baltic states, which is a very difficult challenge. Um, and we've been thinking about what we were going to need to do in order to deter a Russian attack and defend against it, uh, all of which was going to involve having American and NATO troops actively preparing to fight uh, Russian troops and execute a variety of scenarios. The Ukrainians are in the process of destroying the conventional Russian military. And it's not a proxy war. The Russians initiated, the Ukrainians chose to fight it. It's not like we goosed the Ukrainians into defending their land. Um, but the Ukrainians are executing uh, the theater contingency plan that we, in principle, been preparing for and should have been preparing for. That's, again, very cynically, that's great for us. And we should be leaning into helping the Ukrainians complete that uh, process and weaken the Russians in a way that will make it take a lot longer for the Russians to reconstitute. But here's the other thing. The Russians probably will ultimately reconstitute. And I think it's unlikely, the, you know, the least likely scenario is that Putin goes and is replaced by another Gorbachev or another Yeltsin. That's the, that's the least likely scenario at this point. The likeliest scenario is that when Putin goes, and he will go, we also need to get that through our heads. Um, when Putin goes, um, he will probably be replaced by somebody who shares his ideology. And that ideology is going to be hardened uh, toward avenging this defeat, that that's normal. I mean, you know, it's the Russians are behaving with incredible evil. Putin is making decisions that seem very strange to us, but it's important not to forget that Russians are still humans and they are going to do human things. And one human thing is they are going to be determined to avenge themselves for this defeat. And so they will come back and try to attack Ukraine. They will come back and try to pressure NATO and potentially try to prepare to attack NATO. So we can't imagine that there's anything that we can do now that will just take that off the board and make it so we don't have to worry about Russia anymore. We're going to have to worry about Russia for the foreseeable future. And so we should be thinking about what are the conditions that we want to create in which the Russians will have to operate as they try to reconstitute and avenge themselves and prepare it. Okay, having the Russians driven as far to the east as possible in Ukraine is advantageous. 
having the Russians lose Crimea is very advantageous from a purely geostrategic standpoint. Crimea is very important. And we should we should get it. We can talk about this more, but we should get a little bit out of this whole mindset that we, you know, this is Crimea is some sort of red line, and and we absolutely can't discuss having the Ukrainians. We take it because Putin will do whatever. And that may be the conclusion we come to, but we need to recognize that it's actually super important territory. Yeah, say a word about that because I do feel like Crimea yeah. is just there are a lot of Russians. It was you know the Russians are. Have an yeah, attachment yeah, yeah. to it, and therefore it's off the table or something. But talk right. about it as an actual <laughs> right. strategic matter, not as simply a, you know, right? Yeah. So the the issue, I mean, apart from the fact that obviously as the base for the Black Sea Fleet, um, if the Russians are in Crimea, they pose a much more significant threat to Ukraine over the long term than if they're not in Crimea, because the the way the geography works out, that allows the Russians to be in position continually to threaten the only. Uh, access that the Ukrainians actually have to the sea, the route by which most of the grain is exported to the world and 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 all that sort of stuff. So they put it, it continues to hold Ukraine continually at risk um, in a way that's very serious and very significant. But if we forget about Ukraine for a minute, the difference between the Russians have Crimea and they don't have Crimea is a difference of a couple of hundred miles uh, that the Russians are closer to or farther away from the southeastern NATO flank. Hmm. And as we think about the prospect of defending Romania, defending Bulgaria, um, having the Russians interfere in Moldova uh, and try to position themselves on the Romanian uh, border in between you, you know, Romania and Ukraine, operate in the Western Black Sea along the NATO littoral, the, the question of whether the Russians can base in Crimea or have to base in Russia itself matters a lot. The ranges are important. The missile ranges are particularly important. With Crimea, the Russians have the prospect over time of turning the Black Sea into something like a Russian lake. With the combination of air defense and long-range anti-shipping missiles and things that they can put on the Crimean aircraft carrier, even apart from whatever the Black Sea fleet is going to be able to do if they can keep it floating. So... It really, and I'm not even talking about Turkey, but obviously this is also very important to um, the country we have to continue at least formally to identify as a NATO ally um, in Turkey matters a lot there. And then there's a whole bunch of other economic issues that surround the peninsula and the waters that are associated with it. So Crimea is very, 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 very geostrategically important. And we really need to look at the costs involved to us. And the irony is, Crimea is probably the single most strategically important terrain to NATO of any of the terrain that the Russians still hold in Ukraine. Hmm. And it's the one that we're saying, well, no, no, no. I mean, you, we, you know, we don't want the Ukrainians to, to do that. But really? I, I want the Ukrainians to take Crimea back. I'm, I'm open to a discussion that the risks of escalation or something else are such that it's unwise. But our position should be that we want the Ukrainians to have Crimea for our own good and for theirs. Yeah, that's very helpful, very interesting. As you say, so much of the discussion is this sort of a shorthand, almost cartoonish, like, you know, there were Russian speakers there or there, and, and the Russians have been attached to it for centuries, so we have to rule it out can or I, yeah, like Can that. I just can I just talk about that for one Please. second? Because this this argument is particularly sort of baffling to me. So um, the Chinese position, of course, is that Taiwan is part of China. So does that end that conversation? Right. Lots of lots of countries hold the position that they 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 have historical claims to various parts of the globe. Do we do we support all of those claims, or is it only if they actually invade and then we're scared of them that we support those claims? Here's a fact, and this is a fact that people need to get their heads around: the Russian Federation, in its current political existence, formally recognized Crimea as a part of Ukraine twice. It recognized um, it as part of Ukraine when it uh, recognized Ukraine as an independent state in its current borders as the Soviet Union collapsed. And it not only recognized it again in 1994 um, with the Budapest Memorandum as a result of which Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, not only did the Russian Federation recognize Ukraine in its current borders, including Crimea, it guaranteed the territorial integrity of Ukraine in its current borders, including Crimea. 
Yeah, which is so, a heck of a lot more than the Chinese have ever done about, the, I mean, the, the idea that exactly. we should be serious about Taiwan, but we're really pushing it there in Ukraine. It just seems so backwards. I mean, I'm for being serious about Taiwan too, don't get me wrong, but you know, it's- Right. No, yeah. it's it's completely insane. So this is a whole conversation, which is, this is the conversation that the predator state wants us to have yeah. about what the, its rights are to dismember a state that it has recognized multiple times. And Putin's position is Yeltsin shouldn't have done that. And my and my to which my answer is um, that's a shame for you, right. but he did. Right. Yeah, take it up diplomatically as you wish in terms of Ab- abs- know, absolutely as other I mean, countries have in terms of, absolutely yeah. complain. You know, if you want it economic, but what the one thing you don't get to do in the in the world that's anything other than a complete jungle is you don't get to just invade and take it and say, well, this is you know rightfully ours. No, I mean. <laughs> So let's run through a bunch of issues. You've raised so many. This has been very helpful to me, at least in just understanding, I think, the basic military situation uh, with with the limits, obviously. It's so fluid and all. But okay, the alliance, uh, NATO, you mentioned a couple of times. Good news, basically, over the last year. Uh, uh, What are the challenges? What what Europe Europe and NATO? Let's just have a give me your quick judgment on that. Putin made a number of wrong. assumptions when he invaded Ukraine, one of which was that he would be able to split the US from Europe and he would be able to neutralize uh, NATO. That was a false assumption that didn't happen. And the Biden administration deserves a lot of credit for a lot of very hard and very successful work to cohere the alliance behind not only the principle of defending Ukraine, but the practice of actually doing things that major allies didn't really, really, really didn't want to do. And so um, I do think it's important, as we criticize the Biden administration, to recognize this this was an accomplishment and it wasn't inevitable. Now, the Russians have helped a lot in keeping the alliance together by just being unabashedly evil. But the Biden administration has also worked very, very hard to keep the alliance together. Uh, together. And again, as I said, to get it to do things that it really didn't want to do. Getting the Germans to send Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine was a big deal. Yeah. That was a huge change. Um, getting the Finns into NATO is an unbelievable accomplishment. I never would have expected to see that in my lifetime. Um, if uh, things work out in Turkey such that the Swedes are end up in NATO, that'll be in some, res- in some respects almost even more remarkable. Um, that's all very good news. And the, the alliance has held together uh, remarkably well for a long period of time under a lot of strain. Coming back to the energy policy, Biden administration did actually do a lot of things that I think surprised some people um, in terms of helping the Europeans offset the loss of Russian uh, natural gas um, and get through what was fortunately for us a mild winter in Europe. Um and does seem to be helping the Europeans to decouple sort of permanently from from the Russian energy supplies, which will be a huge geostrategic shift in our favor, uh, which is which is a good thing. Um, yeah, that's an important I thing that, and not not an expected oh, yeah. thing. I and no, no, no. we were lucky a little bit, but I, I'm struck when I'm in Europe and I've been a couple of times the last two months. How much that's just changed people's thinking from a year ago. You know, it makes it makes it much easier yep. to then face the other realities and without the energy Absolutely. tugging you back, so to speak. You know? Absolutely right. I think the biggest the biggest biggest criticism. I mean, this, I've got plenty of criticism for Schultz um, for the Germans. It's hardly worth making the criticisms of the French. Macron. It's just. I mean, it's just this is what French do. It's very unfortunate, but this is sort of what they do. Um, Schultz is, I think, well, let me put it this way. I I don't understand German politics, so I don't understand the domestic constraints on what he can actually do. But there's still far too much echo of Ostpolitik in the approach that he's taken that I think he is having the hardest time really understanding where Germany actually needs to be now. I think the Biden administration has done a lot to push him in the right direction and has got him farther than I would have expected. But the Germans really need to sit down and have a hard think about things and realize that it's the days of Ostpolitik are gone and Russia is an enemy 
Russia identifies Germany as an enemy. And the Germans are going to have to wrap their heads around that. I think that's going to be hard for them to do. That's been a little disappointing. The one criticism that I would make of the Biden administration, I guess I guess there are, there are two, maybe. We have seen a continuation a little bit of a determination to prioritize keeping a coalition together for the sake of keeping the coalition together, even if that means reducing what the coalition actually does. Now, I don't want to go too far with this because keeping the alliance together was incredibly important. Um, and they have got the alliance to do a lot this way. But it is important that we keep in mind that at the end of the day, it's the effects as well as the, the strength and size of the coalition that matter. But the other thing is, look, the Biden administration has been a bit of an uncertain trumpet. Um about exactly where we stand and exactly what it is that we're prepared to do and what we're prepared to support. And considering how difficult it is to galvanize a coalition like this and galvanize an alliance like this, the uncertainty of the trumpet from the US is has undermined some of the otherwise very good work that they've that they've done. But in general terms, I think NATO is in a much better and stronger place as a result of what the Russians have done and as a result of what the administration has done, then I would ever have expected it to be at this time, Russian invasion or no Russian invasion. You know, what struck me on a couple of these recent visits to Europe where we've tried to meet with, you know, well, with pro-Ukraine people, but some different types of pro-Ukraine people is the younger Europeans, I'll general, overgeneralize, are better than the older Europeans. They don't remember, I mean, they have no attachment to the dreams of Ostpolitik or to the economic relationship or the peaceful change that was going to happen due to the economic relationship with Russia or China. Perhaps we'll get to China in a minute, but um, if you want. But, um, you know, it's very striking in Germany in particular, but also I'd say in some of these other nations in the North, uh, in the Nordic nations, but also in Central and East Europe, the younger generation, whatever their views on other things, and maybe they're a little, uh, well, whatever their views on other things. I mean, the they look at the world and it's like, we cannot live, we do not want to live in a world in which Putin can just, you know, invade a, a European country that's not very far from us, send hundreds of thousands of refugees into our countries. And they've been very good about taking those refugees and treating them well, incidentally. They don't get enough credit for that here. Uh, yeah. and, and, and sort of just get away with it. That's not acceptable. You know, that's not, and so they are in a way much, see, I think much more clearly, and this includes German Greens who 15 years ago would have been semi-pacifist and, you know, and um, I mean, it, in fact, it's even more noticeable, I'd say on the center left of the European political spectrum, some of the social Democrats, but, but some of the younger CDU people in Germany, but the center, and also the other, this is, I don't curious what you think about this, the Biden administration so understandably, it's the way the State Department works and so forth, prioritizes Berlin and Paris and its dealings with Europe and to some degree Brussels. And I think Americans don't realize how many impressive voices there are in Europe, in the Czech Republic and Estonia and Finland and so forth, and how much those countries are doing. And that we should feel proud to be part of this alliance, many parts, many, not all of whom, it never is the case, right? There's always laggards, but many of whom are doing a heck of a lot, and many of whom are right there on the border and at some risk, you know? And um, I don't know, I feel like that's been a bit of a, a, the Biden administration hasn't taken advantage of that as much as they might have back here. And as you said, the Biden administration's own slightly uncertain trumpet has an effect back there in Europe. So if you're a German politician, you... You're willing to kind of go pretty far if you're being Ukraine, break a little with Schultz if you're a social democrat, which is a little risky, obviously, for political reasons. He's the head of your party. But, you know, are you really going to break with him if the administration is just going to, if the U.S. is going to retreat six or 12 months later? So there is a bit of a, right. either a vicious cycle or a virtuous cycle, depending on which way it, it goes. No, look, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I think the frontline states uh on the whole have been amazing we have a look we have a problem with poland which is that we we have issues with the current polish government right and we should have issues with the current polish government there are there are issues to be had with the current polish government um the poles have been amazing um in taking in ukrainian refugees and being the base of support for all of this and they and the baltic states have um have really had some very good uh, strategic thinking about the importance of all of this, and they've galvanized a little mini coalition within a coalition over there that's done very, very important things for Ukraine. Um, and we do 
get too caught up in counting tanks and uh, counting just you know pure dollars and underestimating the importance of what the Czechs have done, what the what the Balts have done, what the Poles have done, um, what the Brits have done for that matter, um, and and getting you know getting too fixated on the on the Germans. Um, you know that having been said, when the urgent requirement is for lots of stuff, um, you have to go to the places who have lots of stuff, right? Um, and that's you know that's 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 been our focus. Um, I do think over the long term, working to strengthen the uh, ties between the Eastern NATO partners and the Western NATO partners is important. I think those ties are always going to be fraught because the, the Eastern states are, you know, appropriately focused on, on the threat to them. The Western NATO states, it comes and goes. Um, that's always been true. So I think we, that's going to be something that um, I suspect we have been working on, but that we're going to need to work on even more. There's one other aspect of coalition dynamics that I think is very important to call out here, though, to, to expand this discussion beyond Europe. What the Japanese have been doing and what the South Koreans have been doing is remarkable. They have identified Ukraine's cause as their own. They have leaned into helping uh, support the countries that are helping support Ukraine. Um, when the Japanese prime minister goes to Kiev, that's a really remarkable statement. It's also a really remarkable repudiation of the notion that somehow this war is irrelevant to Taiwan or a distraction. Right. Uh, it's fascinating that the, the people who most think that's not true are the Japanese and South Koreans and the Taiwanese who totally see this as centrally tied up with Taiwan. And we might ask ourselves, why is that? Part of it is, of course, you know, Russia's a Pacific power and the Russians have been demonstrating, you know, just did a bunch of exercises in the Far East to remind everybody that they're also in theory a Pacific power and, and aligned with China. So it's not the case that what the Russians do and where they are has nothing to do with Asia. It does actually have something to do with Asia. But that's not, that's not the real issue. The real issue is that Taiwan has a chance of remaining free as long as the United States is prepared to defend it. And if we're not prepared to defend it, then it's going to be very hard for, to, to imagine how the Taiwanese can defend themselves against a you know, country of 1.4 billion uh, people or whatever the current Chinese population is. The whole world and the whole Asian rim is looking at us to see, are we prepared to spend money to allow the Ukrainians to defend themselves and are reflecting on the question that if we're not prepared to spend money to let the Ukrainians fight, are we going to spend blood to defend Taiwan since that's the, that's what would be required? So there's a very, very direct correlation here that our Asian allies absolutely see. They also see the principle at stake. It's the same principle you, you, you identified young people in Europe seeing. If, if we allow the Russians to establish the principle that threatening to use nuclear weapons as part of a campaign of aggression will actually back off countries that are committed to the defense of the victim, the Chinese will law, draw exactly the same conclusion. The Chinese also have a nuclear arsenal and can threaten us. So for lots and lots and lots of reasons, our Asian allies regard the outcome of the Ukraine war as being incredibly important to them. And they are working to solidify a relationship with our European allies that could, if we develop it properly, help us in deterring a Chinese attack on Taiwan as well. Not because I would imagine our European allies sending military forces there, but because, and this is a whole other conversation topic that I've been working on with uh, my colleague Dan Blumenthal at AEI on a project they're working on together about how to defend Taiwan. The one thing that was also been very clear is that Xi Jinping is more worried about alienating Europe and driving Europe away and getting himself cut out of the European market than he is about aggravating Putin. That's been very, very clear. 
That's a very important data point as we think about ways that we can persuade Xi that attacking Taiwan would be unwise. So this is the other part of what the Japanese and the South Koreans and the Taiwanese are working to do is to establish strong relations with the Europeans such that Xi Jinping really will have to think about the consequences in Europe of an attack on Taiwan, which may be one of the best ways to deter that attack. Yeah, and also to deter him perhaps from helping Putin more than he's going to do some Absolutely. stuff and he is doing some stuff. But I do feel that maybe the Biden administration plus the Europeans have done a little more than people realize to, maybe it's just lucky, but I mean, Xi could have done much more to help Putin and, oh, we, yeah. and, and it could have really damaged Ukrainian prospects in the war. And on the whole, but correct me if I'm wrong, my sense is on the whole, he hasn't, he's held back and he's either- That's right. Either he doesn't care, he doesn't like Putin much, or is happy to see them all bogged bog down, which is well for true, or, and, or he's a little worried about, I mean, he may have written us off as being kind of just hostile for the next 20 years or whatever, but he's, he is worried, I think, about the Europeans following us, let's say, down a path of really yes. being, is, yes. do you think that's right? About, you know. uh, no, I do, I do, I do. I think, in this, I think this has been the primary thing holding him back. I think he very much wants Putin to succeed. I think he wants Putin to succeed. Um, I think he's, I, I mean, one of the reasons he's not backing Putin is because Putin's losing. And, you, right. you know, the old saw, right? Nothing succeeds like success. Well, nothing fails like failure. And um, that's that's been a major issue. But I, it's very clear that the fear of alienating Europe has been a huge factor holding Xi back here. And we have been working that. Among other things, the Biden administration has been making it very clear that we're not prepared to give the Chinese a pass on violating sanctions, that we are we are prepared to come after them if they do that, which has implications for the Europeans. And it does show a degree of American leadership in terms of standing up to Xi that I think is very important. Um, and, and we've also been rallying the Europeans um, on that subject. And in, I think encouraging a lot of these ties that our Asian allies have been making in Europe as well. So no, I do think that there's been a lot of very good scene uh, behind the work, behind the scenes work that the Biden administration has been doing exactly to make it clear to Xi that he has to factor in the risk of massive economic dislocation that could come if he alienates Europe by doing some of these things that the Europeans really don't want him to do. And that I that's probably been the most important factor deterring him from leaning in more, I think. Let's look forward. I mean, what does relative success look like? And, and is it possible with that some kind of security guarantees to Ukraine, whether Ukraine has 100% of its territory back or 95% or whatever, let's just say the, the, the ceasefire is accepted or it just happens in a sense. Um, but for the reconstruction of Ukraine and also the defense of Ukraine, as you were saying earlier, there has to be robust um, relationships with, the, with all of us, with Europe and, and the US, and also a lot of confidence, I think, for the private sector certainly to, to be willing to reinvest there. Um, but, but everyone says they they can't get into NATO right away. So how does how does that work? Well, look over the short term, what we most need to focus on, I think, is the is the program for reconstructing Ukraine and re uh, rebuilding the Ukrainian armed forces and giving the Ukrainians the defensive and I do mean defensive capabilities that they need uh, to deter uh, the future Russian attack. Um, it matters a lot where the lines are frozen. Mm -hmm. uh, if the lines are frozen anywhere near where they are now, the Russians are going to be in a much more advantageous position for a future attack. It's going to be much harder to uh, figure out how to um, create a really effective Ukrainian deterrent. And it's also going to be a lot harder to reconstruct the Ukrainian economy, um, since a lot of the territory the Russians now occupy is actually essential to the Ukrainian economy. So. For all of those reasons, success has to look like the Ukrainians regaining a very significant portion of the territory the Russians are currently occupying, especially the territory beyond the 2014 um, lines. I've said what I have to say about Crimea. It's, it's important. Um, it's not necessarily existential, um, but it, it matters a lot. But security guarantees... Look, on the one hand, I said the Russians are going to be determined to avenge themselves on Ukraine for this defeat. I'm sure that that's true. On the other hand, if the Ukrainians actually manage to regain a lot more territory and destroy a lot more Russian forces, 
it is going to be quite some years before the Russian military is in a position where any sensible Russian military officer is prepared to go to the president and say, yes, sir, I think we can do this now. So that creates a window. And in that window, the West needs to step up and help the Ukrainians make themselves the porcupine that they can be and make sure that we never allow there to emerge a window in which it looks like the Russians might have a relative advantage uh, in the military, you know, military reconstitution such that they might be tempted to try this again. That's how we avoid having another one of these in a few years is by building up the Ukrainian deterrence um, rapidly. So we need to have a plan for that and we need to we need to be leaning into that. And then, of course, we need to be encouraging our allies to lead the way on the reconstruction of Ukraine. That's not something that we should we the U.S. should be primarily paying for, although we should you know pay for some of it. it is in, it is in our interest. Um, this there is a Marshall Plan here where Europe need where Europe needs to do a Marshall Plan, and our Asian allies need to help um, with the Marshall Plan to reconstruct Ukraine uh, properly and avoid and this is important avoid the danger that the Chinese will think uh, to offer the Ukrainians attractive reconstruction um, money and try to get themselves in there. So this is this shouldn't be something where we just say, well, somebody else should pay for it and we don't care who. Hmm. I do care who. It needs to be the Western Alliance plus its Asian partners, not trading one adversary for another. Um, so that, that matters. In terms of security guarantees, um, in the current configuration of NATO, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be challenging. I think the more that it looks like Ukraine can defend itself and the more that it looks like Ukraine is a net asset to the alliance, um, and the more that it looks like a war with Russia is unlikely and made even more unlikely if we bring Ukraine into the alliance, the easier it will be actually to get Ukraine the alliance protections that I think it needs. The more all of those things seem dicey, the harder it is going to be to persuade reluctant NATO allies uh, to take on something that looks like a potential liability. So I think these things are intimately interconnected. If you want, as I do, to have uh, Ukraine gain the alliance protections that I think it should have and make the contributions to the alliance that I think it can and would, we need to help Ukraine develop the military and economic capabilities that it needs to be able to come to NATO and say, the Russians are not going to be invading us anytime soon. If we join NATO, the Russians are not going to be invading us, period. And that will be off the table. And that will help stabilize this part of Europe rather than leaving it in danger of future instability. Yeah, a quicker victory leads to more stability more quickly. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know. And more peace more quickly, probably. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I was in Europe, and one German at a round table, private round table, said, gee, it sounds like what people are talking about would be a new Cold War. Uh, that would be very unfortunate. And another German actually said, well, we're already, this is, we are in a new Cold War, you know, and the key is to make it, keep it cold as much as possible and therefore end this war as quickly as possible and, and then do what we need to do to deter our enemies. But I, I would say that Europe, and I just, maybe we can close on this. I mean, how much do you believe, not so much Europe, but I'd say us too. How much have we come to grips with the world we're living in in 2020 here on, when we're having this conversation, May 1st, 2023, that we're likely to be living in, you know, for the foreseeable near and medium term, at least, uh, assuming you agree that that's the case. And um, I don't know, how, how, how far along are we? And maybe we look back at the old Cold War and we're nostalgic about Truman and Marshall and think everyone was on board in 48, 49, 50 for what had to happen. <laughs> for the, if you had told people that, and actually it's 40 years and it's going to have a Cuban Missile Crisis 12 years in and it's going to have this and that and Korea is going to be very, very difficult and Vietnam kind of disastrous. I mean, you know, people were not on, you know, I, I mean, hopefully we don't have any, some of those things. But anyway, I'm just curious, where do, you, where do you think we are in terms of where we should be in terms of thinking about uh, the world yeah. we're facing? Well, I mean, listen, as you, uh, as you, as you will recall, Truman got the NSC 68 memo and stuck it in his drawer, uh, took it out only after the North Koreans invaded. 
So it was it was very far from being the case that it was obvious that we were going to end up doing what we did throughout the Cold War. And this, so maybe this, this needs is just the equivalent yeah, of the North Korean kind of invasion. Like, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's what this should be for us is is galvanizing us to realize um, where we are, which begins look by realizing that it takes one to make war. Art. It's not enough for us to desire not to be at war. If our enemies desire to be at war, then we're at war. And this this is something that we, we have a hard time wrapping our heads around this idea, honestly. Um, but the Russians have made it very clear, Putin has made it very clear, that he regards NATO as an implacable foe that must be destroyed, that he regards the United States as an implacable foe that must be destroyed and split from Europe. And that he regards Russia as the, as the rightful suzerain of the former Soviet states. He's driving that ideology deep into the Russian psyche. Uh, again, maybe there will be a miracle and maybe, um, <laughs> you know, maybe Vladimir Karamurza will emerge from prison and, and become the next Russian president, which, which would be a wonderful thing. Um, in the real world, that's extraordinarily unlikely to happen. So this, the Russia we're looking at is the Russia that we're likely to be facing and that is a Russia that seeks to destroy us. That is a Russia that seeks to defeat us. So yeah, it's a cold war, optimistically. And the, tr- and the trick is to keep it as cold as possible. Uh, we're in a cold war with China now. Um, the Chinese have been steadily expanding their territory. The Chinese have been building up their military capabilities. The Chinese are threatening to do all kinds of things, including invade Taiwan. Our job is to deter them. That's what we need to do. Um, we haven't you know, we're in this mode where we're still coming out of the 9-11 wars and, and we're telling ourselves, okay, we, we don't want to study war no more, right? Because we, we've we spent 20 years at war and Biden administration is trying to extricate us from all of that. Um, I'm not going to get into that further, but we're, you know, we're sort of feeling still kind of war weary and, and, you know, we don't, we don't be involved in this stuff anymore. And I think that that is hanging over us too much. And it's preventing us from recognizing that the, the world is what it is. It's, it's, it's an incredibly dangerous place. And uh, we have major powers that identify themselves as our enemies and uh, want to revise the world order in ways that would be incredibly damaging to us. And we, we, we really, really need to get our heads into that game, however much we want to or don't want to. Listen, you know, the... Chinese and the Russians and the Iranians complain all the time that the current world order is unfair, that it's unfair to them, that it favors us. They're right. It does favor us. And it is, if you like, unfair to them. Speaking as an American who believes in our values, I think that's good. It's unfair to them because they're determined to live in a different kind of world with very different kind of values. Okay, it is in our interest to have a world order that favors us. And it is in our interest to defend that world order against the threats to it. We have been very we've been out of the out of the mode of thinking in this way for a long time. And I think this is the mindset. Again, go back, read NSC 68, one of the most brilliant uh, grand strategic documents ever written, articulated very, very clearly what the stakes were and why the United States flourishes in a particular world and suffers in a world that's very different. That's Those are the stakes now as they were then. I don't think that we have internalized that now, and I think that we really need to. I think that's a sober but uh, challenging note to end on, but also a little inspiring as NSC 68 was and the actual uh, the conclusion of Kennan's uh, was a Mr. X article. Actually, is quite you know this is a challenge to which we, we would be proud to. We should be proud to. We have to face it. We know it's not our choice, but we should be proud. We would we will be proud later if we have faced it adequately. And I think that's very much the the case with Ukraine. And of course, uh, maybe a little. Well, then we had some things to inspire us too in the behavior of some of our friends and allies. But really, the Ukrainian behavior, I do feel like the, the, the yes. has been truly inspirational in a way that's rare in, in human history. I agree. I, I agree. And the, the, this war all along has shown the strength of a free people uh, fighting against an enslaved population and the strength of a decentralized, robust civil society 
against a vicious, brutal autocracy. Um, that is a lesson that we should take close to heart. And by the way, Ukraine is a very flawed country. Um, it always has been. Um, looking at it before the war, a lot of people were very reluctant to believe that the Ukrainians could do anything effective because of all of their flaws. Look at they've they've done the most amazing things that anyone could ever possibly imagine. Um, we ought to reflect on that also as we as we become preoccupied with our own flaws, hmm. um, and consider, you know, I, I don't think we should write ourselves off quite yet. I'm not sure that we would measure up to the Ukrainian standard, um, but I'm I'm not prepared to say that we wouldn't if we faced a, a similar existential threat. Well said. I, I agree with that. That's really a great note to end on. Fred Kagan, thank you uh, for everything you've been doing, honestly, for the last year and a quarter in terms of the, the war in Ukraine. And uh, thank you for being uh, being with me today. Thank you so much, Bill. And thank you all for joining us on Conversations. <laughs>